Hello, everybody, and welcome to the front row with Jerima. I'm so excited for today's conversation um, and just so excited about just the whole reason we have this day um, planned just to talk about this amazing book and just the content in it. So as you are coming in, tell us where you're from. Tell us if you attended the HBCU, where did you go? Um, and this is de definitely an interactive conversation. I will be, of course, interviewing Claudia, um, getting into the nits and bolts of the book. But I also will be um, posing and showing comments from the audience. So share this as you're coming in. Share this live. Um, it is on Burst into Books Facebook pages, and it's also on our YouTube so that anyone can access it. So as you're coming in, tell us again where you're from, if you attend the HBCU, and as we're talking, if there's anything you want to amen or give us a question, we will we will bring it up. So before we you know wait any longer, let's jump right in. Hello, Miss Claudia Walker. Hi, Jerima. How are you? I am awesome. I um I love this part of my work because I just love being able to introduce our audience and just um, families to amazing authors and just like the message of the book and the colors. And I, I just loved everything about it. So we're going to jump in. And I always start with the beginning. And so the beginning for me is tell us like your journey. What led you to getting to the point of being the author of ABCs for HBCUs? Like I know there's a lot of backstory. <laughs> That leads to that. So you got yeah, I don't know. I don't know that we have that much time. <laughs> but what brought me to the to this place? I mean, obviously it had a lot to do with my experience and my time at Spelman. So um, I attended Spelman College for undergrad, and I'm from California. So um, in California, we don't have. I'm from the Bay Area in particular. Okay. There are no HBCUs here. Um, there's Charles Drew Medical School, which is in Southern California. But I wasn't, I didn't have access to HBCUs. And so I really credit my journey and my decision to my mom who uh, graduated from Savannah State. Okay. And mom used to talk to me all the time about how incredible her college experiences were. And um, coupled with that, I also loved different worlds. So I'm wearing, I don't think you guys can see, I'm wearing my. My helmet. Oh, helmet. <laughs> and so growing up and not having access to the, that HBCU community, different world on Thursday nights at 830 really brought me into that culture. And I was just amazed by it. And that, along with my mom's stories, really set my intentions on going to an HBCU. I wasn't really sure what that school would be. And then my my senior year in high school, I took a, a black college tour okay. to the Atlantic University Center and had an opportunity to see all the amazing schools there. And so that's when I decided to go to, to Spelman. And then I don't think I really had any intention on becoming a writer. I I knew that I wanted to be, well, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I thought that I might've wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't know what that would look like. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward years later, I'm, I'm an educator. I am, I'm a teacher, but I'm also an administrator. And so I've spent the last probably 15 years of my life in education. And so my, you know, when I, when I started teaching, my goal was really to make sure that I was giving my students what Spelman gave to me. And again, I'm, I'm a teacher here in Oakland, California, and our students do not have access to HBCUs. And so I think it was that experience coupled with, you know, being a mom that made me say, how can I give this type of experience or exposure to not just my students, but not just my, my students and my children, but to, to kids everywhere? How can I find a way to expose them to HBCUs and also just lift up our institutions? And so... About two years ago, I came up with the idea and, you know, like many ideas, you work on it and then you put it down because life takes over. Um, and then really during the pandemic, I got really focused. Actually, last year, I got just really focused on changing my life and really living the life that I wanted to live. Um, and I finished the book and got connected with Jessica Boyd, the illustrator. Wow. That is, I mean, you just said so much. And I think the part that I love the most is just, uh, the one like all the different touch points you had of, of exposure and now wanting to have that same for your kids and even your own child um similar to you i'm an educator here in chicago and we have chicago state university which is where i went 
Um, however, the same thing, I went on my eighth grade trip. We went to D.C. I fell in love with Howard University. Me and one of my um, best friends talk about it all the time of just like that campus. And then the same thing, I'm a high school teacher. And one of our staple programs at our high school is doing an HBCU tour. Wow. And, and, we'll, and we'll get to what I think HBCUs do for our students and do for um, children overall. But the same thing, like, I feel like once they they hit a campus, they feel a, a sense of belonging, right? Yeah. Um, students who didn't want to go to college are like, maybe this is a possibility. Um, and the same thing for a different world. I think that just that exposure and just seeing that representation of seeing, because I think a lot of times people don't understand why we pub HBCU so hard. And yes, it's historically black college and university. But and we'll have a question coming up. It's like the feel, the community. It, I mean, it's so many different aspects, right? And um, I just love that you hit that, that that for you, even though you didn't have it, once you got it, let me let me show this to others. And so what do you say are like the inspiration for the stories that you write? I know you say you want to do exposure, but uh, what really was like the main theme and message you wanted to have in this book? Um, I think it, it, it always goes back to culture. Mm -hmm. It really goes back to culture. I, for the past couple years, and, and as a mom, I'm constantly asking myself what my impact on the culture would be. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to leave this place without having, in some way, positively impacted my culture and my community. And so that was really my inspiration. And you know, fortunately, and, and, and the reason why I named it the ABCs, is it's not just about Spelman. I could have written an entire book just about Spelman, right? But we have over 100 HBCUs, and there's so much inspiration. There's so much history. There's so much culture in not just the foundings, but how these schools have persevered and the people who have come out and the people who educate there. And so that really inspires me because we have this collective community um, of shared experiences and also very di different experiences based on the campus that you attend. Um, and so that that was really my inspiration behind writing the, the stories. And so I know you have the book, but then you also have HBCU prep school. So can you talk a little bit about where did that come from um, in this whole journey? Okay, so that goes back to teaching. When I first started teaching, I was teaching, I started teaching sixth grade middle school. I started teaching middle school and everyone thought I was crazy. They were like, middle school kids are just wild. And, and I, I loved it. I fell in love with, with my class and I, I looped with them. So that next year I taught the same group of students in seventh grade and then I taught them in eighth grade. And it really felt like they were my own children. We had our own classroom and we just built this sense of community. And I really, for a long time, toyed with the idea of opening up my own school. You know, when you get into education and you see the, you see what, what works, yep. and you understand what doesn't work, and then you understand those barriers to, to you know, systemic change, uh, you start to question, well, maybe I'll just take a go at it myself. Maybe I'll do it myself. Um, and then I started having babies and I got tired. <laughs> I said, I don't know if I really want to go that route. You know? And so, but I, I've always had this dream and people say, just open up your own school. You should open your own school. And I, I, I didn't obviously, but I think the name of the school really um, represents part of that desire that I've always had to open my own school. And so even though it's not a physical school where I have, you know, students coming in, it's a publishing company. And so my goal and my idea with having this school is that I'm gonna educate students through the books, through the different content that we push out, and I'll be able to impact more students than I would have by you know, staying in my community and opening a school, right? I'll be able to send these books out and impact students around the world. Um, and so that's just the name of, of the publishing company uh, as you probably know, I self-published the book. Yeah. And so it's published through HBCU Prep School. So that in itself is leads me to my next one. So as on this um, on this um, interview, we have so many different people who watch. We have family members, we have educators, we have aspiring authors themselves. And the whole process in itself, because I've interviewed both published and self-published. So even you just said a mouthful as far as being an author, but also a publisher. So what was kind of like your 
you know, you have people on here like, I have a book on my heart as well. Or I have this idea that I've had, or I could, you know, you even said like having a family, we can feel like that stunts our growth and things that we can do and not stunts our group, but can defer our dreams in some way. Right. <laughs> right. So it can kind of put some stuff on the back burner, but you just moving forward and pushing forward. So what would you say would be some tips? What was like your research process and figuring out like, okay, I want to publish I want to do self-publish and I'm actually going to create my own publishing. Like what, what did you look into? What did you research? And then just kind of the creative process of even public, you know, putting your book together. Right. So I did. Um, so I had already started writing the book before I had a clear idea of how I would get it out. I just had the idea, started writing it down, you know, stopped for a couple months and then I'd pick it back up. When I, really focused down when I, when I really focused in and started writing the book and knew that I was going to see it through to fruition because my family kind of had a joke. My mom would say, your daughter's going to write a book before you because I, 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 I know I <laughs> like, you know, a serial entrepreneur and I come up with all of these ideas. And then, like you said, sometimes it's life. Sometimes it's that that self-doubt. Um, and so oftentimes I would just talk myself out of doing things. And so when I finally got to the place where I knew that I, I wanted to birth this book, I, I did start researching. And because I knew nothing about the publishing industry, I thought, well, maybe I should just go through uh, a traditional publishing house because it felt easier. It felt, you know, I knew what I wanted to write about. And so I, I thought, well, maybe if I can get picked up by a publishing house, then I can just give it to them and then they'll do everything and then the book will pop up somewhere, you know? And so the more research that I did, I recognized that I would have not as much control over the process. That was the most important thing to me. I did not want to put, so I didn't want to write the book and then put the book in the hands of people who maybe had no understanding of what an HBCU was, who didn't understand the culture because they would be responsible for uh, finding the illustrator. And so I didn't want them to come back to me and show me something that really didn't feel connected with the book as far as I was concerned. And that's how I decided that I wanted to self-publish. When I realized that, I just, the first part was just writing the book yeah, and finishing the, the script. And then I knew that the next part would be finding the illustrator um, and then once I found the illustrator, once I found not the illustrator, the Jessica Boyd, let's be clear. Okay. <laughs> I found Jessica um, and she picked up that part of the project. Then that, that freed up some time that I had to figure out how I was, you know, what the next steps were and trying to figure out well, how do you format, you know, how do you find someone to print the book? How do you distribute the book? So it was really just doing the homework, doing the research. Um, and fortunately, we live in a, a, an age of technology where a lot of that information is out there. So, you know, I Google, I go to YouTube and I, you know, type up things and, and really try to figure out what the, the next step of the process was. So even um, which I'm so excited. So earlier when we were posting this, Jessica was like, I'm going to be on. So Jessica, hi, I know you are watching. Um, I need you to know you did an amazing job on that book. It is beautiful. And you are so correct that um, that's one of the things that um, published authors I talk to, they always say like, hey, you know, there's this myth that, you know, we tell the illustrator, this is what I want it to look like or X, Y, and Z, but they're really working in two separate, you know, <laughs> right. And then you just come back and just really hope that they embodied your vision. And so um, I think that that does matter, especially if you're trying to publish your book. That's something to consider. I mean, if I want to do self-publish, there may be that extra, you know, begin grind. But you do really have all um, creative ownership of it. Right. Right. Um, so this question actually came to me this morning because I saw a post my friend made. And when I heard this song, I said, you know what? We're going to have this conversation about HBCUs. This song makes me feel as if I'm walking on an HBCU campus. Like when I walked into like my HBC, uh, when I went to Howard and when I went on this HBCU, HBCU trip with my students, this song is what hit me. And so that song is Sounds of Blackness, Optimistic. Ooh. Whenever I hear that song, it just makes me feel like, you know, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm, you know, I, I'm in my vibe. I see people that I connect with. And so this is the song I wanted to pose to you. And it could be multiple songs. 
Which songs describe an HBC feel to you? It could be a song you feel like describes how Spellman feels to you or just in general. And I would love for those who are watching to put it in the chat as well. When you think of an HBCU or your HBCU, what song comes to mind if you want to describe the feel? Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> I love Sounds of Blackness. Um, so I have three. I would say the, like the, the general daytime, you know, HBCU song, I would, I, I think um, is Before I Let Go, both uh, Frankie Beverly and Mays and- uh, And Beyonce. <laughs> it just, it feels like a family reunion. It yeah. feels like a song that everybody can get into, any yeah. generation. It feels like a celebration. Um, the other song, well, let me go to my, my first song. Um, <laughs> That describes this film and experience of me being in my dorm would be Silver and Gold. I think it's Kirk Franklin. Yeah, Kirk Franklin. And that song came out um, when I was in school. I started um, Spellman in 95. And I just remember the, the cleaning staff mm. is like a huge part of my HBCU experience. They would just blast it in the morning. That was how we woke up, seven in the morning. They go over to PA and they'd be playing silver and gold. And you'd be like, can we just get a little more? <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just one of those songs that really um, reminds me of me and my roommates and um, just that experience. I would say my club HBCU song. Yes, yes. If you buck, you know? Yes, I love that song. <laughs> yeah, those three songs. I love it. I love it. And so again, you all put in the chat what, what it makes you think of. Uh, Jessica is giving you a virtual hug right now. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I totally agree. I think that a lot of times, you know, as we get to the book that we have to remember is that a lot of times when we're talking about HBCUs, it's not just the actual physical space, it's also just the feel. And so we can get right to the ABCs of HBCUs. So when you were when you got the final product in hand, did you feel like this is it and this is really embodying what it is I want families to get in their homes? Yes. Um, I have to say, so we started doing pre-orders in October and it took a long time for the books to get here. So I actually didn't know if they were going to make it. We got delayed in customs for a while. And so I didn't know if we were going to be able to get them out. So honestly, my husband was working behind the scenes with customs and when they arrived, I was happy, but I, I wasn't able to like sit and, you know, have a glass of wine. <laughs> they were here. It was like, okay, we got to get to work. We got to yeah, start you yeah. know, them out. So I really, every now and then I would stop and be like, it's real. And, you know, look at it. Um, I think when it became real, real for me more than when the books arrived, because I felt so much pressure to, to get everything out. Um, was when Jessica sent the final files. You know, I knew I, because I was able to see everything then. And so that's when it became real. When I sent it off to the, the printer, that's when it became real. And throughout the entire process, it, it felt like a, a complete dream come true. I just have to, again, I can't talk about the book without shouting out Jessica Boyd. She is such an amazing, um, such an amazing, brilliant, uh, artist, and she is as much a part of this story and this book as I am. And like I said, it was the reason why I didn't want to go with a traditional publishing house because I knew that the words meant something. I knew that the words really, um, you know, told the story of many of the HBCUs. But we're talking about, you know, this is not a dissertation. It's not a dissertation for a PhD, so it's I need some I need some illustrations. I need something that's going to engage the readers and the children. And so Jessica was a huge part of why the book looks the way that it looks, and why when you know we see kids that are really responding to it, they're responding not just to the words, but they're they're seeing themselves yep. through those you know those illustrations. Uh, and early on, Jessica, when we were talking about the project, she said. I think that we should do this without faces because the children are able to really, you know, they're looking and they're like, that that looks like me, that complexion, the build, the hair. And I can actually see my face there, um, you know, because they're able to, to kind of project onto the images. And so she's just an amazing part 
of this process. And it's been a complete honor to work with them. I love it. And I just want to just acknowledge those that are commenting in the chat. Thank you all for coming. Please share, share, share. We're actually about to get into our live reading. Uh, we have some power people on the on the live. We have Alabama State University. We also have Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. He said, I did not um, attend at HBCU. However, uh, in his travels, he's visited many, many campuses. And he's also a part of Real Man Read program here in Chicago. And so, Vincent, I think this needs to be added to y'all catalog. As you go out to these schools in Chicago, definitely um, at the bottom, you all see that I put where you can purchase this book. I think we should all add this to our home libraries. We definitely are going to be adding it a part of first into books. Um, I think this will definitely be a great addition to um, the different schools around around the city. And I just want to, before we get to the library, we got some some songs. What did it make them feel like? And uh, Katrina said that she thinks of taking it back to music, Dangerous by Busta. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was definitely a good song. And uh, Jessica, as I think is just befitting when we get into the reading, says, a dream come true. It was a perfect way to describe the project. Lily couldn't have asked for a better author and created a work with a magical first for us both. So, um, Jessica, I would love to connect with you and actually bring you on to talk about the illustration side. So connect with me. I would love for that. But at this time, you all, we are ready for our live reading. I am going to pull myself out and enjoy along with you um, in the comments. You know, give us your opinion. Shout us out. Give us questions um, that because we're going to come back with a few more before we close out. But you got the floor, Claudia. All right. Okay, so this is my first live reading. I'm super, super excited. So let's get into it, everyone. Let, let me adjust. Okay, the ABCs of HBCUs. Make sure you guys can see. A is for Albany State and Alabama A&M. Alpha Phi Alpha and Alcorn State. A is for the ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha, dressed in pink and green since 1908. B is for Benedict, Bowie, and Bennett. Bethune-Cookman started with less than $2. The Bayou Classic is the Black Super Bowl. Battle of the Bands will make you wanna holler. Okay, let me get a rhythm here, hold on. <laughs> C is for Clark Atlanta University, steeped in community, culture, and knowledge. C is for Charles Drew Medical School and for Cheney, the oldest historically black college. D is for Dillard University, Delaware State, Diplomas and Dreams. D is for the divas of Delta Sigma Theta, deeply rooted in their crimson and cream. F is for FAMU in Florida. Their marching band is a sight to see. F is for Founders Day at Fayetteville State and the soulful sounds of the Fisk Jubilee. E is for Elizabeth City State University, endowment and education. We must support our HBCUs as they've supported us for generations. G is for Gramlin State Tigers, founded in 1901 in Louisiana, with the mission to educate the children of farmers like Gadsden College in Alabama. H is for Hampton University, homecoming and the halftime show. It's a different world at, at Hillman College and Howard University, HU, you know, I is for independence and icon, inspiring us to be greater. It's for ITC in Atlanta and the men of Iota Phi Theta. J is for the 80% of black judges who graduated from an HBCU, like Jackson State in Mississippi and Johnson C. Smith too. K 
is for Kentucky State University and the knowledge that we attain. K is for the brothers of Kappa Alpha Psi. Keep twirling those crimson and cream and cream canes. L is for Link is for Livingstone College and for Langston, also known as LU. Can't forget the legacy of Lincoln University. It's the first degree granting HBCU. M is for Meharry Medical School, Miss Mississippi Valley and Morgan State. Of course, it's for Morehouse College where boys become men and men become great. N is for Norfolk State in Virginia and North Carolina Central University. It's for nonviolent protests and lunch counter sit-ins by brave students at North Carolina A&T. O is for Oakwood University, built on the land where Dred Scott was sold. O is for Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity. They know that friendship is essential to the soul. P is for Phi Beta Sigma, Payne College Pride and Paul Quinn. It's for Philander Smith University and, and PhDs at Prairie View A&M. And happy Founders Day to the men of Phi Beta Sigma. Q is for quad, which is a dorm for four. It's also the courtyard where students lounge. Q is for quintessential campus queens, making history while wearing their crowns. R is for Russ College in Mississippi, where the learning never ends. It's for those revolutionary roommates one day strangers, next, lifelong friends. S is for Sigma Gamma Rho and Step Shows. Savannah State and Southern are second to none. Such a sacred sisterhood at Spelman College, serving black girl magic since 1881. T is for Tuskegee University, and its first teacher, Mr. Booker T. Those trailblazing red-tailed Tuskegee Airmen, Texas Southern, and TSU in Tennessee. U is for University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, where Black students are uplifted and embraced. Support the United Negro College Fund, because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. V is for valedictorians at Voorhees College, Virginia Union, and Virginia State. V is for the University of the Virgin Islands, the only HBCU outside of the United States. W is for Wilberforce University, known for its world-class educators. W is for Winston-Salem State University, and Wiley College, home of the great debaters. X is for Xavier University, where students know their worth. Did you know it's the only HBCU affiliated with the Catholic Church? Y is for the students, young, gifted, and Black, yearning to make their ancestors proud future lawyers, scientists, and artists, history makers standing out in the crowd. Z is for the zenith of Black excellence. And for those who inspire us to be greater, Z is for Zora, her eyes watching God, and for her sorrows of Zeta Phi Beta. There aren't enough words Sorry, there aren't enough letters to honor HBCUs created when reading while black was a crime. These bold and audacious institutions tell the story of how we still rise. The ABCs of HBCUs. 
I hope you guys enjoyed that reading. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know I'm I absolutely love this book. Um, I gained more knowledge to share. Thanks. I will purchase the book. Uh, <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. I love it. Amazing job, Jessica. Amazing job, Claudia. Others uh, really allowing, I think, at a very um, good, excellent, great, great, great. I think it's just a it's just amazing, like you said, representation matters, and then just learning the history of these different schools. Um, I have friends who attended HBCUs as well, and they just take so much pride, not just in the academics, but just the history, right? Um, one of my really great friends with the Fist, he's always talking about the Jubilee Singers, you know, um, all the halls and different, and different campuses mean different things, and so I just think it's just important um, for us to be able to share this knowledge. Um, and the earlier we learn it, right? I think the, the earlier we start implanting those school names in our kids' brains, uh, they will become more curious about those schools themselves. So my next question to you is, how difficult was it to get the first book published? I know you already talked about the customs and all of that, but um, once you got it going, like once you learned the process and got your illustrator and all that, what? What would you say is roughly the timeline? I know you said you start writing during the quarantine as well. Uh, what? How difficult would you say would be this first one? And how has it prepared you? Because we know there's more coming. So <laughs> how has it now prepared you for your, your upcoming books? It's just understanding, trying to get a better understanding of the process. Um, when Jessica and I, she's probably laughing, but when Jessica and I first connected, I think my timeline, I was like, I want to get this book. That, you know, we got like, three weeks, a month <laughs> to get these illustrations done. Um, and we just realized that wasn't, well, it could be a realistic time frame, but it wouldn't look the way that it looks. And so it's understanding what the, how long it takes to actually get the illustrations done. It's understanding how long it takes to um, get the printing. And if you're printing overseas, understanding how long it takes to get the shipment here and then the customs process. And so I have a better sense of it um, in terms of how difficult was it. I would say it's not difficult. It's not difficult. Um, and the funny thing that I've had a lot of people ask me kind of what feedback I would give. And I, I actually say, be, um, be careful who you ask for support or for advice. Mm -hmm. in the, in, when I started the process and when I was even looking for an illustrator, I reached out to someone who is a published author whose book you know, we have in our home and I really respect them. And when I reached out and said, hey, what advice would you give an author or an aspiring author? The person said, if I know what I knew now, I, would, I never would have embarked on this journey. And it was a bit, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and if I happened to have been in the place that I was maybe a year ago, I would have let that doubt talk me out of this. And I realized that's nothing but the devil. Like this yeah. book is supposed to get done. Yeah. So keep pushing through. Sometimes you never realize why people say the things that they say. But so the answer to that is it's not, it's challenging, but it's not something that anyone can't get done. Exactly. So it's doable. If it's something that's on your heart, you can get it done. I love it. And it's Exactly. I mean, everyone has their own journey, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and you and I love how in sync we are. You went straight to my next question of like, what would be the advice you would give to someone who is aspiring writer? And just that, like yeah. uh, you said, be careful about who you're getting your advice from, especially when you're starting out and just understanding, you know, their journey may not be yours. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what would you say is next? Like, what, what what do you desire next when it comes to maybe not even just uh writing books but your publishing company and i do have a question do you or do you publish for other people are you starting to build this do you want to do this for other authors as well i do know people looking for their books to be published are they able to contact you like what what what's your next thing yeah i i want to get there at some point but not right now i don't think that i have enough you know I don't think that I have enough experience to, if, if I were to take somebody on now, we'd be going through some of those ups and downs. They'd be going through it with me. Um, and so I'm still really trying to figure out my process. Mm -hmm. I have other projects that I'm, I'm working on, but I, I will definitely get to a place once I've really figured things out, 
um, to where I will take on other other authors and publish through my publishing house. But it's, it's like anything else, right? If you just started being a teacher three weeks ago, you can't really mentor other people. You can tell them what you've gone through, but you're not you're not that expert teacher yet. Yeah. So it's something that definitely is a plan of mine, but just not yet. Got you. And I have at the bottom, you know, people can, and we have a couple of questions from the audience because I did ask for them to pose if they have them. But I have at the bottom how people can get in contact as far as with um, ordering the book. Is there any other avenues in which you will want um, people to know how they can stay up to date on what's happening, you know, and what's going on with the book? Yeah, thank you. So yes, you can purchase at the website, um, or you can, if you want to stay, if you want to stay up to date with what's going on, um, you can follow me at HBCU Prep School on Instagram, and we also have a Facebook page, HBCU Prep School. Awesome. So we have a question, and uh, we also have Michelle who is watching, who's also from Oakland. So she wants to say hey. <laughs> Business. Okay. Right. So she's excited to see you doing great work. Um, the question he posed at first before he saw you was in Oakland is does your school provide programs where um, you're able to read in the school? Yeah, so I'm in Oakland. Um, so by reading the school, do you mean physically reading or like a virtual reading? Probably so more virtual now. I know um, Real Men Read previously to this, we'll, we, they will have like set days. They actually come into the schools and read. But I guess now if they're doing it virtually. Well, yeah, so I'm definitely open to doing more virtual readings. Um, and when things open back up, I'd be happy to, you know, come to different locations and read. So you can just contact me. Um, there's a there's a contact me page on the website. Yeah, so he was saying physically or virtual. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, well, my next question for you is just simply, what do you um, see maybe the next series in this book being? Like, I think you got the ABCs of HBCU. Have you really, have you thought that far out of what could possibly be some other things that you would want to add to the series? Well, I want, I'm, I have a couple of ideas. I definitely want to do an activity book because we're getting a lot of, we've been contacted by different counselors um, and one of my colleagues who is a college counselor posted it. And so we've gotten a lot of response and this, you know, the book is being used for, for high school students and I'm also a high school teacher. So it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. I know that there's a need for this to be translated for older students. And so I want to work on that. Um, a coloring book. I have a lot of ideas for it. I also have been getting a lot of feedback from, um, from customers saying, you know, love the concept, but like, where's my school? So unfortunately, because it, it wasn't a book that, you know, I didn't, I could have written the book and just listed schools and not given a history of it because it's in uh, like prose form. I wasn't able to include every school. Mm -hmm. So I am definitely, um, I definitely have a plan to, to release another edition of it where we include more HBCUs, uh, so obviously I can't do that without Jessica. So when we, when we get to that place, um, I, you know, we'll pray that Jessica is willing to, to continue on this journey with me. I talked about the remix. So, um, but there are a lot of, I mean, there's so many HBCUs. There's so much history exactly. go on and on. So yeah, I have a lot of plans for, for that series. So no, we have one more question that came in. Um, with your self-publishing journey, what printing distributor did you find best? And what is the best way to you found to advertise and market? Yeah, so with the printing, um, I'm still going through that process. I'm actually with my, we are reordering, we've reordered books, and I'm going with a different printer. Um, the best advice that I can give, and I'll probably start, when I have a little more downtime, I can start kind of sharing what that process is. I use Alibaba, which is, um, it's it's almost like the, the Chinese version of Amazon, but for kind of wholesale. And so I went on Alibaba and tried to source. Um, I can't, I don't wanna say exactly what printer I use because I had a little bit of a hiccup with the first printer. So I wouldn't wanna you know, endorse that 
that company. And then the second run haven't gotten that yet. So again, I haven't vetted them and I don't want to like put a stamp on something that I can't like really stand behind because I don't want y'all to be like she said. Right. <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> um, and then, and, and so another thing, uh, you know, you also, if you're, if you're publishing or self-publishing, you have to think about your target market and how many you think you can sell. Because I was pretty confident that we would be able to sell, you know, a lot of these books. But if you if if you're not exactly sure, you can do a test run where there are some published there are some printing companies here within the United States that will allow you to do a smaller run. So you can print a hundred or 200 and test that out and see how well it sells. And if it, you find that it's doing well, then you can, you know, increase your quantity and, you know, print a thousand or 10,000 or however many and go overseas and do that. There are also a lot of um, on demand uh, publishers. I think Amazon does that where you, you know, you, you're whoever comes in and decides that they want to buy the book, it's printed on demand. So you don't have any excess inventory. You're not holding anything. Obviously the cost is more expensive, but there are just a lot of different ways to go about your, your publishing journey. You've just got to figure out how you want to test your market first. Yeah. Um, and then the best way to advertise and market, we have been really blessed. I think we've spent maybe $50 on advertising. And I think I did the 50, I know. I think I did $50 before we even had the books or before, I don't even think Jessica was done with the, the illustrations. And I was just excited. I think it was when, when I first got onto um, to Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so we have done minimal uh, marketing and advertising. It's really been a lot of word of mouth. I also, I homeschool my four-year-old. And so I had created these AB, uh, these HBCU flashcards. Oh, wow. I took a video of him saying his ABCs and that went absolutely viral. I think it may have a million views or something at this point. And that was so organic. And that drove a lot of, um, that drove a lot of people to my Instagram and to my website. And I did a free download for maybe a month of those flashcards. And so that was a way to get people engaged. And so I think if you're able to find something that you can give away that may be connected to your your book or the topic, that might be a good way to like advertise and to market. I love that. And it just even, I want to echo just like knowing your target audience and really like, I love that whole idea of seeing if it's what they're, you know, we can be excited about a lot of ideas. <laughs> And like, are the audience really going to respond to that idea? So just doing things in phases, I think is really wise. And, and um, they just said, thank you so much for the feedback in the amazing book. Mm -hmm. uh, a question just came back. Is the flashcard still available? The flashcards are available. Um, yes, they're on the website. They're $7 and it's every HBCU. So yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think... Unfortunately, we're at the end of this time. I, I've so enjoyed this time with you, Claudia. Um, and I just want you to know one of my um, co-workers who also um, attended at HBCU, she went to Miles. She uh, saw an advertisement and she knows that I do this. And uh, she was like, Jerima, you have to interview her. Like, I think that this would be so cool. So she is the inspiration that Introduced me to you, and I was just so blessed that she did because, again, I'm so big about um, not only our children being exposed to so many different types of literature, especially those that highlight our history, but I just think there's just a beautiful product. Like you, and I truly believe that it was a need. Like I, I think the reason you only paid fifty dollars is because there was a, a audience looking for this book for their children. Um, especially if you've attended the HBCU. So thank you. Thank you for um, listening to your instincts and going with it because many of us have, you know, amazing ideas, but sometimes we don't execute it. And I think that this is a reminder to anyone watching, like, go for it. Yeah, you have go to. for it. We are waiting for it. We are waiting for it. They said, thank you. Wish you success oh. and prosperity. <laughs> um, I will definitely continue to follow your journey. And I can't wait until we are able to open up. You got to come to Chicago. 
Oh, yes. I have family in Chicago. My dad oh. was raised in Chicago. So, yes, I, I can't wait to get back. Yay, we would love to have you here. But thank you so much for taking some time out on your Saturday. Thank you so much for those who are watching because this is live. If you comment after this, we can definitely uh, respond to you. If it's something that's directly to Claudia, I will make sure it gets to her if she doesn't see it on the live. And again, at the bottom, go and purchase the book. Support, support, support. And uh, we look forward to seeing you continue to grow. Thank you, Jerima. I have to thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.